that's great okay so thank you um for being here and thank you for hitting record uh, christian and uh now we're going to have uh marianne uh Vinesville. is that right is that even vaguely close right. uh, not really <laughs> one of our senior research software engineers here at uh, iccs who will be telling us a bit about uh what she thinks about reproducibility so over to you marianne thank you um, I am um, just trying to share my screen, which has annoyingly many clicks. Right. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, and um, apologies in advance. This is not a very well uh, prepared talk. Um, I called it uh, software Repro reproducibility, what it means, why it matters and how to do it. What's a lot to promise. I could also have told it my brain dump about software reproducibility. So I um, really hope um, that um, this is uh, useful for you, um, that you're um, learning something. And um, please do not hesitate to um, to to interrupt me at any time. So I might not see your hands up or so, but um, just um, interrupt me if I'm not um, explaining something very well. And um, if you want to know more a bit about it, um, something, um, I hope everything will go um, okay. And if everything goes smoothly, I will probably not need the hour to talk. Um, but if you have lots of questions, that's no problem as well. So um, the first question is, um, what do we mean by software reproducibility? And I've stolen this nice little comic by MCKCD, um, which shows you basically what's um, that reproducibility is actually the core or a core principle um, of science. Um, so saying, OK, um, if we do something and we observe something, we're not going straight away and write a paper about it, um, but that we are actually testing whether this happens again. And um, this is a principle um, that um, should be applied to codes as well, so that we're not um, basically getting this result once um, as we want it, but we can actually reproduce it and other people can reproduce our results as well. So um, if I would now go um, to your repository um, and download your code and do what you tell me to do to run your code in the README and documentation, the question is, would I be able to um, get the same results um, that you got um, when you um, produced your publication? So the results that you've written in your paper. Or an easier question would I be even able to run your code or compile it? Do you even have a repository that I can find? So um, this is basically um, an, uh, uh, a ladder that you can go up um, uh, when you want to make your um, code reproducible. So if you start from the bottom, so you can make sure that somebody can find your code and that they can compile it, that they can run it, and then that they are able to um, reproduce um, what you have um, claimed in uh, your publications. So why um, do we even have to have a code about uh, a, a talk about this? So why is this not something that's um, totally natural? That's what some everybody makes uh, sure to do because it's it's really important if we are doing science um, that we make sure that we can prove um, that our claims are true. Um, and the big problem with this, and this is especially but not only true for software, is um, that in academia um, there is this. Um, uh, pressure um, that you have to publish, um, value is in new results that you put out there, and there's not a very high um, value laid upon good software, and most software engineers do not have um, actually a training, and most researchers don't have actually a training in software engineering, 
And um, if you look at um, career progression or so, um, better software is not really a criterion. And it's even really, really hard to get funding if you say, oh, I want to improve my software. I want to rewrite my software. So it's just in very recent um, years that um, EPSRC or so have realized, oh, actually, we might need to make funding available for something else as, than just the next shiny result or so. So of course, um, as I said, it's not just the problem in software-based research um, that reproducibility is an issue. And um, there has been something that has been called the replication or reproducibility crisis um, for um, quite a while now. Um, in 2005, John um, Ioannidis um, wrote this paper, or it was an essay rather, why most published research findings are false, where he, um, proved through a statistical um, argument that actually um, due to uh, various biases and various um, problems like small sample sizes and so on, actually a lot of the findings in um, medical research and psychology and so are not um, really real findings. Um, there have been since then several controversies, especially in the 2010s, where there have been a couple of um, well-known results that were even um, being taught at university or so that have been proven not right so that um, actually the studies upon them uh, which which they were based upon have been not properly um, done and that um, actually nobody could reproduce um, the results from the studies and um, although students have been learning for years or so that this is what's true it turned out that um, it wasn't and um, this basically then has been has led to criticism of the research practices and um, especially, as I said, in, in the medical field. And so there have been discussions um, um, about these kind of things. So if I tell you now, so you have to make sure that your code is reproducible and that your results, um, that your claim have to, uh, other people have to be able to actually um, get the same results. Um, what are your incentives to do that? So, um, one main incentive that many people um, will give you is that they will tell you horror stories about what will happen if you don't do it. So, and um, these are actually true stories. And there are things like um, the retraction tracker that will show you how many um, papers needed to be retracted for various reasons and not the least um, common reason is that um, after something was published and then maybe cited in other papers or so and built upon, it turned out that there was actually a bug in the code um, that led to the wrong results and that they then had to retract their paper. Um, but it can be equally bad if the results are not um, actually detected because um, there can be uh, decisions taken based upon this false software results that can be rather bad things happening. Um, but uh, maybe um, if we're talking about the kind of software that we are writing, which is not medical um, software, so um, there is um, the big um, issue of a lack of trust. And by lack of trust, I don't uh, mean necessarily that um, somebody like, um, you, you know, um, in the recent years, um, people don't uh, trust science. And then there's um, somebody on, on Twitter or so um, saying, oh, actually, I will go and try to reproduce their results and run their code. And if not, oh, there will be a shit storm. storm. No, I mean rather this trust of your um, co-laborators, um, about um, trust of other researchers, um, that can be um, damaged um, by wrong results. And then these, this lack of trust will trigger uh, trickle through um, various layers of the society and so. And then there can be things like the headlines that we had um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, where there were serious issues with the code that was used um, to actually make decisions about lockdowns and so on. And um, there had been um, yeah, a huge outcry. I don't know whether you have seen that at that time and so, but in RSE circles and so there had been a huge outcry about um, the code that had been used um, there and that it was actually in a really, really bad shape and it was not really clear that this code actually does the right thing. Um, another um, issue that you have with bad code is um, that you have serious software sustainability issues. 
And by that, I mean um, that if you have a new member coming into your team, it will be really, really hard um, to learn all they need to know about the new code. And it will take weeks until they are able to actually um, start working on the code um, if it's really hard um, to, to get it running again and to understand it. And it might be even that the code has one hero developer. And if that person is leaving your team, um, it might be that that nobody is able to actually um, continue working with that code and continue developing it. Or it might be that it's just a code um, that is used by, by one person, one postdoc or one PhD student, and the next person will then go away, uh, will, will then come and throw um, that code away and um, start all over again. So um, these are basically all the stories that you can people tell when you say, oh, yeah, you really have to make your your software um, reproducible, your software sustainable, and so because all these bad things can happen otherwise. But maybe, maybe we want to look at the positive things. So what can happen positively if you have a good reproducible code? I mean, um, if it's easy to rerun your experiments, then it's not easy for the other people, but also for yourself. So if you um, realize that you have to change the parameter, that you have to um, change the data that you're using or so, it is, um, can, can be a real pain if you rerun or have to rerun all the experiments or so that you've done, and maybe you've already created figures in your, for your paper or so, and then you realize, oh no, I have to do it all again. And then, how did I get these these figures actually? How did I get um, these results? So it's it's really um, nice for yourself as well if that is a really um, easy thing to do and you can just um, run the script again and then um, everything um, will be updated. Of course, that there's also the issue of technical depth. So um, if you make sure that you're um, that your code is clean, that you can um, rerun everything. And so there's not this big thing that adds up. So basically this thing when you say, oh yeah, I, I will do this after the next paper deadline. I will do this after the next conference. And so, and then your code um, just declines and maybe your branches on GitHub or so just diverge so much that you're not able to merge them again. Um, I put a question mark behind um, the saving time and computational resources because, of course, first of all, you will need some time to make your code um, reproducible. But um, in the long run, um, you will save time. You will um, actually save time for the rest of your team as well. It will be much easier to onboard new team members. It will be much um, easier to or, or quicker to, to make them um, actually contribute um, to your research. And all in all, it will also be uh, much uh, better in, in your collaboration. So if you can actually tell um, other people you're collaborating with, oh, um, and see, this is our code and you can actually have a look at this and so and you can play around with this. So, so um, this is the building of trust that I was um, talking about earlier. Um, I've actually um, had a look around um, yesterday and found a paper that was actually um, relevant to climate science. So there's a, this paper, The Critical Need to Foster Computational Reproducibility, where the authors um, uh, had um, put a questionnaire out to, um, I think, around 300 or so participants um, in earth science and asked them about um, um, computational reproducibility. and um, Basically, um, their main outcome was exactly that what what I was um, talking about so far, that um, the the um, lack of reproducibility that was certified um, in in that research field is jeopardizing the trust in computational research. That there's a lack of knowledge on establishing software development methods, and that open science is still not widely practiced. So, on the next two slides, I've just got um, two. Um, to, to figures out of that paper. And um, I hope um, this is big enough for you to see, um, but um, one or two key things that you can see here is that they say, okay, there are actually 82% of scientists that have um, not had formal training in 
programming and um, the, um, they, they say that it takes two to three weeks um, when the new PhD comes into their group um, to actually train them up um, with the research software that is used in their group. And they say um, the reasons they see for the lack of reproducibility are things like a poor documentation, um, the work of the workflow and the code and the complexity of the code. Okay, in this field, you probably cannot change that, but you can do something about how you structure your code and how easy you make it um, to deal with it. And um, uh, if you if you look um, at the at the top part of this figure, um, they actually say um, that there is a real lack of a reproducibility or so, but they think that their own research, their own scientific work is reproducible. So this might be another one of those problems. Um, and then if you look at um, the solutions, um, of course, everybody will say, oh, um, if we get not more money, then we can solve all the problems. Um, but um, there are a lot of things about um, basically guidelines and um, that they need um, people basically to tell them to help them and I especially like that they are talking about um, research software engineers um, somewhere here so hire more research software engineers so I'm all for that um, but um, also that they find it really hard um, to deal with all um, the technology and all these things about licenses and um, new workflows and languages and so so here you see um, this um, citation here down here where they say oh they are just so overwhelmed by the quick change in the field so in the field of the technologies that are being used so they um, would need people who actually concentrate on this part so that they can do their science. So um, I would say that um, over the past, um, say, um, 10, 15 years or so, um, a lot has already changed. And there are actually a lot of initiatives and groups and so on who work on better reproducibility. So there are conferences and journals um, that start to actually ask for the software and the data. Um... <laughs> Talking too quickly. Um, to, to back up the research findings. Um, the Software Sustainability Institute, um, research software engineering and so on, on have become a thing. There are groups internationally who are doing this and who are lobbying for this and um, who are um, providing training and so on. And um, I actually, and you will see in the next few slides, I could come up with quite a lot of um, groups and initiatives also who are interested in reproducibility. But um, if you look outside your bubble, um, you will probably um, see um, that it's still not widely known. So even if I ask my friend um, here at the university or so, um, they might still um, not know what the research software engineer um, really does. <laughs> so um, I think there's still some dissemination work um, that needs to be done. And I think I will start here by um, just um, having a couple of slides um, to um, quickly go through maybe um, about uh, various initiatives. And if you are interested in one and want to know more than what I'm saying at that point, um, please interrupt me and ask. And I've also put a couple of um, of links um, at the um, end of this presentation. And I think I um, I don't know whether these presentations will be um, shared, but I've also put my email address there. So just email me and I can send you uh, my slides and then you can click on all the links and read more about these various um, initiatives. Um, so to start with um, is um, the UK Reproducibility Network. <clears throat> and I put a link here. Um, that um, uh, links to um, international networks as well. Um, it's a peer-led consortium within the UK and they have a steering group, but also local and inter institutional groups. And they have um, events, they provide um, training, um, 
you can in, invite them along for a talk at your institution or so, and they are also engaging with state stakeholders. Um, so they are really um, lobbying for reproducibility not just for software, but overall, so for research reproducibility. And um, they have a particular focus on biomedical sciences, which is, I think, the field um, they've, they've started from and so, but they are engaging um, with other fields as well. Um, then um, in a similar field, actually, I think um, mostly psychology, there are the riots riot science, um, which have groups at various universities, mostly in the UK, but I think there are a handful um, outside the UK as well. And um, they again um, um, organize events and um, conferences. They have um, weekly seminars. And um, if you follow them on Twitter or engage with them or so, um, you can you get invited to all the seminars no matter where they are. So they are open to everyone and um, they just um, send basically out um, the Zoom link or so and you can um, then go to the seminars. And RIOT stands for um, Reproducible Science, Interpretable Science, Open Science and Transparent Science. And this is one of those um, uh, 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 those those organizations or so um, who are basically in various um, variants or so um, lobbying for this same thing, so for open and reproducible science. Um, then there's the Turing Way, and on their website they say the Turing Way is a handbook, a community, and a collaboration, and um, they are um, um, interested in open and reproducible data science. Um, but data science um, nowadays is um, basically um, almost a science. Uh, so, so there's a lot of overlap um, with um, software research software engineering as well. And so, and if you go to their website, um, so um, what they have is basically this nice website with these nice scriberia um, illustrations that they have um, everywhere. And um, the website is the handbook, and the handbook is basically made by the community. They have these book dashes that come up and um, where you can then basically work on a new topic for this handbook. And um, you can see um, the various um, topics that they are working on. And there's a whole chapter on reproducibility. And if you go on that website, you will see a lot of links and then um, for further um, information about reproducibility and um, reproducible science as well. Then there is um, FAIR for research software. And this is something um, that's been um, created or a guideline that has been created by the Research Data Alliance. So it's, you might be aware that FAIR data has been a thing for a while now. And um, then there came together a working group of, I think that were like a hundred people or so, um, who came together and worked on adapting these um, to software. And FAIR stands for Findability, Accessibility, interoper Interoperability, and Reusability. And I've just put here um, basically how they, in short, then um, uh, interpreted this as um, something to do with software, because that's slightly different um, to um, what you um, have for, for data there. And so you can on the note of find um, their whole paper and read basically their guidelines. Um, there has been um, uh, the advent of batches for papers, and um, ACM has um, created this reproducibility batches. I know that IEEE also did this, but um, I've, I've looked it up yesterday and so on. They seem to have vanished. I don't know when they discontinued it or so. And um, they um, have um, basically various batches um, based on how um, yeah how reproducible uh, basically your paper is, and um, they have um, um, at conferences, um, and I will talk about that um, a bit more in the next slide, or also for for journals for ACM journals or so, um, an ev evaluation system where they basically go and um, look look at the artifacts that you provide, so your data and your software and your description. 
and try to reproduce it. And then you um, get either just the, okay, um, there is an artifact available, so I can find your software somewhere, or um, actually um, the software <clears throat> can made to run. And <laughs> so it compiles and it runs and it does something. So it's functional. Um, then um, that's quite funny because there's uh, uh, something um, a bit um, different from the ACM um, definition of um, replicated and reproduced from um, the definition that you get elsewhere. So in the ACM definition, replicated means that you have um, um, that you take the same data and the same software and get the same results. Whereas reproduced means um, that um, you reproduce it with different data and um, different people do it and so on. In the definitions that you find elsewhere online or so, um, they mostly do it the other way around. So same lab, same data is um, reproduced and um, and and uh, same, no different lab and same data. I, I always get it the other wrong way around or so it's replicated. And um, then they have reusable, which basically means, oh, actually you can use the software um, in a different way, or you can make it part of your software, you can adapt it, so you can actually reuse that software as well, and it still works. Um, the supercomputing um, conference, um, so SC, um, has um, the reproducibility initiative, and I'm um, really um, passionate about this one because I've actually been um, in one of the um, of the committees in 2021. Um, they started in 2015 and um, made the decision that they actually asked for an artifact description. <laughs> and in the beginning it was um, it was um, optional, but what it meant was basically um, that you um, not only submitted your paper, but you also submitted a link to your code and you um, submitted a link to your data and um, some descriptions on how to run your data, uh, your code with the data to get the results in your paper. And in the beginning, this was um, used in the student cluster competitions. But then gradually um, they made this um, um, more and more um, official, basically for the main tracks um, in the conference. So they made it mandatory for certain categories or if you wanted to be considered for certain prizes. Um, then they have the artifact evaluation um, appendix, um, which pre previously was the computational results um, analysis, which um, gave a, um, a longer description also about, for example, um, prerequisites and installation details and system um, um, prerequisites and so on um, to run your code. And um, there now is this ADAE committee um, that evaluates the appendices and then um, awards these ACM batches. And I'm just quickly going down uh, back here again. So it's these three batches that are in the middle that are, that are actually awarded um, by that committee. They used to alternate or wanted to alternate between um, the ACM batches and the IEEE batches, but yeah, as I said, somehow the IEEE batches are no longer um, a thing. Um, and then in 2021, that was the year um, that I was part of that, um, they also um, um, introduced the reproducibility challenge. And um, that was basically uh, another committee um, where then some um, a, a subgroup of the ADAE committee um, um, went to the committee and recommended certain um, papers um, for this prize. So if they would said, okay, we actually wanted to be considered for this prize, then the committee could say, oh, this is this is a really good one and so, and then a couple of people would um, basically present this to the committee members. And then um, um, there was a new prize awarded or is awarded still. So this is a really, really interesting thing. So it also takes a really, really long time, especially because, um, um, supercomputing codes um, can be really hard to run and you um, will need to run them on a supercomputer mostly. And um, 
they have they actually give you um, the possibility um, to to do it on cloud resources if you have do not have the possibility to run it on a local supercomputer and so but it can be quite frustrating as a committee member so to try and reproduce these results but it's also really really valuable and you learn a lot about reproducibility and how it not works um a bit easier is um, the repro hack and the idea of the repro hack is um, reproduce the results of a paper in one day. Um, so this is something that started in 2016. It was, a, first of all, a satellite event of um, OpenCon, um, and it was inspired by a university course by Owen Petschi. And then um, Anna Cristalli got a um, fellowship of the Software Sustainability Institute, where the, she actually then started to develop it further. and. Um, create um, basically a team around that and had more events. There was actually also a HPC repro hack at some point. And um, in 2021, the repro hack hub launch that she also initiated, um, which basically gave, gave you everything to um, organize your own repro hack. So there is material, there are checklists, there's the paper database where people can upload their papers to be reproduced um, together with the um, descriptions and you can upload your evaluation on the repro hack and um, the ad events are advertised there. They also have a Slack workspace. And um, yeah, and it's the, the really nice thing about a uh, repro hack is um, that you actually get to judge other people's codes. So you're not um, actually programming yourself in the best case. Um, so that's what should happen is that you just go and um, try to run that code and see whether you get the same results and um, you work together because um, oftentimes it doesn't work as easy as you would wish. But um, yeah, so that's um, a really fun event. There are more. So there are journals like the Journal of um, uh, Scientific Software, is it? Uh, sustainable Software. Uh, I, I don't remember at this point. Um, Resign C. There's code check, which is something similar to repro hack. Um, there's the machine learning reproducibility challenge this year. There was the climate informatics reproducibility challenge. There are lots and lots of papers out there. So if you start to, um, to um, look for it online, you will see a lot of papers talking about computational reproducibility or software reproducibility or research reproducibility. So it's, it's really a topic. Um, so in um, the next part, um, I want uh, just to now talk a bit about, okay, how do I actually do this now? So I've got my code. I want to make it reproducibility. How do I do reproducible? How do I do it? And um, what I um, first of all want to say is you don't have to be perfect. So you can just do as much as you can do. You can try your best. I've um, put basically here a list, and I will go into detail um, about these things um, in a moment, a list of things. And these are basically all the things that make your code great and that improve your um, code quality, that improve the sustainability of your code. Um, but the first three things are, I think, the mandatory parts for um, reproducibility, and then the the other three things are add-ons, if you will, for reproducibility. Not this is not about code quality or sustainability, or so. So this is for reproducibility. So first of all, you have to put your code somewhere where you can give it to other people. So there are code repositories like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. Um, and then the first thing you should do, um, not for reproducibility, but for yourself is really learn how to use it. So really learn how to use branches and maybe also how to use project boards and milestones and um, all these things that make it so much better to work in the team on your code. So yes, you have your code on your your um, code repository of Joyce. And then um, the next thing you want to do is actually make sure you know which is the version of code that you used for your paper. So um, it's a bad idea to actually have your code 
produce some results, continue to um, develop, and then produce some more results. And then you don't know whether you can actually rerun the results from over here in the end. So um, have a code version for your paper and tag it or um, put it um, to the side, basically, um, so that you know this is um, the code version. You can get a DOI, for example, it's quite easy um, uh, with GitHub, you can um, get a Zenodo, um, GitHub Zenodo integration, and that's really easy, so that you actually know, okay, this is the code for the paper, and I can put that um, with the paper, and I can tell it uh, to the journal that this is what I used. It's always a good idea to, um, if you have it somewhere, if you put your code out there, that you also add a license um, so that users know what they are allowed to do with the code. Then, README and documentation. The README, in my opinion, is, um, is one of the most important things for reproducibility, again, um, because that's basically your cover page and your first chapter. And if people go to your repository and there is no good README, they won't look any further. They will just turn around and walk away. So um, a good README is really, really valuable. And if you want to reproduce a code, um, that's the first thing you look at. Oh, I put in code documentation here in brackets, because um, if we want to reproduce a code, we actually don't want to look at the code. So um, in code documentation is really important, but not for reproducibility. So what do you put into your README? So you put in what does the code do? Maybe which papers are related to it? What do I need to install to run it? Um, what um, libs and packages and so um, do I need? What are maybe the system requirements or so? And then it's often always often always, it's always very um, useful to have a quick start guide. So something that tells the user, okay, install this, install that, run this, and you will have something. And in the very, very best um, case, um, you will make um, something that they can just copy and paste, something that they can just put into their terminal or so and run, and it will do everything. So something that makes it really easy for, for um, users to, to run the first bit of your code. Then you should always say, where do you get your uh, data from that you need for your code? What is the data and what are the parameters? So, so often I see codes where um, <laughs> there's the whole readme and there's the whole, okay, run it like this, run it like that, but it doesn't explain what actually the parameters are and what um, I, I need to know that if I want to change the parameter, I need to know what I can set it to, I need to know um, what it's for, whether I can just leave it out or so. And then maybe um, it's always a nice thing to have a minimal working example or so, and something um, that tells you basically, oh, oh, this works, and this is what you have to run, and this is what you expect to get out. And then um, if you have all of this, um, then if you actually want people to reproduce um, your, um, your paper results, then you also need to tell them how to, you get the figures, because um, it's all very nice to to get all the data out of there and lots and lots of numbers, but um, nobody then wants to go and actually write something to ten, then actually have the same figure or so. So, so you need um, to tell them actually how, how do you, I then get the figures um, for my paper. And then, of course, there are lots of other things that are important in the readme or in the, uh, in the documentation, but not so much for the reproducibility. Um, another thing um, is um, automatization, and that can be semi-automatization. Basically, what I mean is scripts, scripts that um, somebody can run automatically or by hand, but something that basically um, makes sure that you don't have to put the commands in by hand every time again if you want to rerun something. So scripts to run the simulation pipeline, scripts for the figures, scripts for tests, and it will take a bit of time in the beginning, but it will always pay off in the future. <coughs> so that was the mandatory part. Um, 
we are now coming to, to the bonus points. Um, there is testing on continuous integration. And for testing, you um, will use the scripts we just talked about. There are regression tests, which are really useful to make sure that after you changed your code, um, actually you still get the same results. So what you do in regression tests is um, you run your code, you run a test case, and you have basically um, your golden set of results. So you have on the side um, the results that you want to get out of this. And um, every so often, and this, these can be nightly builds, for example, but it could, can also or should be, and that is um, when you come to continuous integration, should also be when um, something is merged back into your main branch or so that you make sure, oh, actually this test, uh, th this change doesn't break my code. I do not get completely different results now, and it still all runs. Then you might want to um, test certain units to, to test certain functions, for example, and make sure that they actually um, work properly. And I mean, um, testing is a whole different topic, and there can be a whole new talk about testing. But um, yes, so, so you want to test the units. Do you want to test them then together again in the integration test that actually all fits together and the pipeline works together? And then you might want to actually use continuous integration, which means that for example, every time that when a new branch is merged back into the main branch or so, automatically um, it will run all the tests and it will make sure that you get um, a notification if something um, has um, broken and if you um, made a mistake somewhere, if something no longer compiles, if something does no longer gives the correct results. And there are a couple of um, tools that um, help you do this. For example, GitHub Actions, GitLab uh, Runners, or some tools like Jenkins or so, um, which can run um, um, nightly builds and so as well. And um, one thing that's often not looked at, but what is also really useful is performance regression tests, where you also measure whether um, after a test, uh, after a change, um, actually the performance of your um, whole simulation pipeline has gone down or so. So um, it's nice to see if something actually improved your performance or so, but you might then also detect, oh, actually this great new thing that I built in and that I thought makes everything better actually degrades the performance. So um, I should have another look at that. So there are things um, that some people think uh, the thing for reproducibility, and I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, so there are containers like Dick, uh, Docker and Singularity, which give you basically the opportunity to have your little box and you um, install an operating system and you install um, all the requirements for your code and you install your code and then you can give it to other people and they can just um, run your code and they can go in there and do stuff um, with your code. And then there are um, Jupyter Notebooks, and there are similar things for other uh, programming languages um, and Python um, by now as well, where you just put text blocks to describe what happens and code blocks, and then the user just needs to click those um, those boxes or so to execute your code. So the question is, what level of reproducibility is that? So some people, as I said, say, yeah, that's great. That's the best you can do. But I've got the feeling, OK, is this not a bit like I'm just walking over and press the button of another person's um, computer and, and basically run what they have on their computer? So I think um, notebooks are probably closer to the... the um, reproducibility and so because you see the code and so um, a bit clearer but yeah it's an interesting thing and it's very very useful so um, containers can be very useful um, for many things um, yeah I'm not sure about the reproducibility and um, the last thing in my list were reproducibility reviews and repro hacks and that leads me back to my questions in the beginning. So if I would go to your code repository and so on. So um, you should every now and then um, 
look at your code repository and look at your readme and think about, okay, if somebody else um, would come and try to reproduce um, uh, or rerun my code and reproduce my results, would they actually be able to do that? And to do that, we don't want to look into the code. We just want to um, to run it without needing to change something or to understand something in depth. And um, it's useful to ask maybe a colleague to do that, but um, I would also recommend to make this part of the onboarding process. So if a new PhD student comes in or a new RSE or a new um, a postdoc or so, um, just ask them without explanation, okay, here's our repository, here's our code, try to run it and then take on the feedback that you get from that. Attending a repro hack or joining a reproducibility initiative is also a great way to learn more about this because if you suffer from the side of the reviewer um, because the readme is no good or so, then you will really learn the value of a readme. If you um, realize, oh, I actually really need to know about these parameters to be able to run it, then you will no longer forget um, to actually describe your parameters. So I would really recommend this. And it just so happens that we will very soon um, announce a repro hack. Um, we are going to um, organize a repro hack in probably in March, probably on March 12th, um, but that's all not fixed. So we're just in the very beginning of um, organizing this. And um, we want to um, invite all the Vestry projects and especially also um, um, PhD students and postdocs, um, but also um, all other researchers. And so to come along and well, to submit papers for it, to get feedback, because it's also really useful to for getting feedback. Um, but also to go there and try to um, reproduce um, each other's um, research. So um, that is something that, um, yeah, that I would really like to invite you to. And it will, in this case, um, be a, an online event. Um, but there will be some, some real announcements of this soon. Um, overall, for the whole reproducibility topic, um, the research software engineers of the ICCS are there to help you. And there are various things that we offer and you might know all of this, but I will tell you anyway. So um, we offer code reviews, which means that we um, look at your code and actually um, go through a checklist and then let you know what things could be improved in your code. Um, of course, you know um, about the RSE support. So there's the ICCS resource allocation process. And this is actually a link. So you can't see it here, but this is a link. And this is also a link. So if you get the slides, you can click those links, but you will also find it if you just go to the ICCS website. So in the resource allocation process, you can ask for RSE support for three months or for six months, or I think even for 12 months. And um, then you get help by a research software engineer um, um, for your code. And another thing that will be or has already been um, announced is the Climate Code Clinic. And there's also a link on the website um, where you can uh, um, actually ask for acute help if you will um, on a certain problem that you might have. So um, you can say, okay, I've got this code and I've got this problem with the code. Um, can somebody from the RSE team spend some time with me and help me sort this out? So really just talk to us and ask us and, um, and we are very happy to help you with that. So these are the links I talked about, lots of links and also some more links to um, some interesting um, articles and so. This is how you can contact me. So I'm in the Slack workspace, the Vestrian Climate um, Community Slack workspace, and this is my email address if you have any questions. And that was it. Thank you very much for listening and I'm open for any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Marion. That, that was great.